I went through Iran, got to Afghanistan, and the more I survived, the farther I felt I could push it. Hi, I'm Michael Moynihan, and welcome to Vice Meets. Today, we are meeting Marshall Curry, the director of Point and Shoot, a recent winner of the Tribeca Film Festival's Best Documentary, and twice nominated for uh, an Academy Awards for Best Documentary. Marshall, welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Give us, and I, give me a praise of this movie. I mean, it's a, it's not, it's a movie about someone coming of age in a way. It's a, it starts and ends with this idea of somebody becoming a man, but it's not an ordinary coming of age story, is it? Well, it's, it's pretty extraordinary, actually. It, it, it tells the story of a, a guy named Matt Van Dyke who had grown up in Baltimore, very sheltered. Um, you know, as he described it to me the first time I met him, he said, I was the only child of an only child of an only child. Were there some influences growing up? The books I always read when I was a child were Choose Your Own Adventure books. <laughs> My mother says that when I was a child, I always had a deep desire for adventure. Matthew! I was raised on action movies. I wanted to be a CIA agent. And then I wanted to be a spy. He sees a film or a, a TV series by an Australian filmmaker named Ali Mangles, who had these extraordinary uh, adventures, expeditions. He'd go sailing, he'd go horseback riding, dune bugging, and, um, and would film himself. And so that inspired Matt to decide not only would he go on an adventure, but he would buy a video camera and he would make an adventure film about himself on these adventures. And he never had made a film before. That's right, that's right. So, so I mean, he had gotten a camera and had yeah. played around with it before, but, but this was going to be his, his film. Did you have this footage and were you allowed to do what you wanted with it? Because Matt isn't, I mean, he refers to this in, in the public as his film too. Right, well, um, yeah, when he first approached me, uh, I got an email one day, I didn't know Matt Van Dyke and, and hadn't heard the story even, um, but he emailed me and said he had just returned from Libya where he had been fighting with the rebels to, to overthrow Gaddafi. But I got this email and, and he said he thought it would make an interesting documentary, he had footage of it. And so he came to New York with um, his girlfriend, Lauren, who, as you mentioned, is in the film, and they met with my wife, who's a producer on the film, and me, and told us the story. And I explained to him at that point that I was only interested in doing it if I could have full creative independence and control of the film. And um, so he agreed to that. And, and the deal that we worked out is, because he had shot this footage that makes up you know 80% of the movie, that he should certainly have a cinematography credit. But creatively, I had 100% independence. Let's actually talk about who Matt Van Dyke is. Right. This is not a guy who gets on a motorcycle and you know rides across. I mean, this is like you know kind of a crazy thing to do. But where does he end up? This is the crux of the film. Where does Matt end up? You're saying uh, geographically? Or <laughs> I, mean, I, mean, what is, I mean, this is not, I mean, this is somebody who's kind of, you know, discovering himself, right. but, but he discovers himself with a Kalashnikov in his hand, doesn't he? Right. He sets off on this 35,000 mile motorcycle trip through all of Northern Africa and the Middle East that takes him through Morocco, through Egypt, to Iraq, Afghanistan, Libya. I ended up getting to Kabul. Traveled around the country, got attacked by a village mob, I got punched in the face by a cop. At the end of this multi-year adventure, he, he comes back home to, to try to edit some of this footage together and make a reality TV show or something like that about, about this trip. And the Arab Spring happens. And while he had been traveling, he had become friends with a Libyan hippie named Nori, who had also been kind of backpacking with wanderlust and, and looking for adventure. And, um, and he and Matt had hit it off. And so when the Arab Spring started and people started protesting in Libya, um, Matt was still in touch with this guy and with some other Libyan friends as well, who he had met while he was in Libya. And they asked him why the world wasn't helping them. And this is before America was involved, before NATO was involved. And it looked like Gaddafi was going to crush the rebellion. And this is, by the way, when Gaddafi says, I'm going to go into Benghazi and just, you know, reduce it to ash and, and rubble. And is, his troops are doing that yeah, at this yeah, point. I mean, yeah. they're, they're just making inroads, rolling back yeah. the resistance that had happened. And Matt decides, I'm going to Libya tomorrow. The 
question that this begs, I think, for anyone, is that we've all had friends that are in places that are, that are you know, difficult and they need assistance, and, and it would be great if there were international assistance. I mean, after Iraq, that becomes obviously very difficult. What, what is it about Matt Van Dyke where he says, I'm gonna go fight on, this, on the behalf of, and how long did he know these people? <laughs> I mean, they weren't close. I mean, it's not people he grew up with. They're not people who he grew up with, but he had spent a number of weeks in, in, um, uh, in Libya, and as he describes it, there was just this connection that he had. When I was in high school, I didn't have many friends. You know, I was mostly a loner in high school. And the few I have, I value highly. And the friends I made in Libya were better friends to me than almost all my friends in America. First one thing. I'm celebrating about your birthday. It just felt like I'd sort of arrived home in a way. And the good friendships that I made really made me fall in love with Libya. A lot of criticism has come, not addressed so much in the film, um, of Matt maybe sort of going there as a journalist and then taking the adventure a little too far. I mean, what do you make of that criticism? I was interested in a uh, kind of more universal story about a guy who's searching for manhood. And the questions about his involvement with journalism it seemed a little bit out of the scope of what I was trying to explore. But, but to your point, I mean, when I've asked him about it, what he says is that, um, you know, when he went to Iraq, you're right, he, he, he filed one story uh, for the Baltimore Examiner, and I think the it was a front page story, and as he says, the next day they went out of business, and he never even got paid for that story. And, and what he says is that when he went to Libya, in, that there was a clear difference between what he was doing in Libya and what he had been doing in those years before. That, that he didn't go to Libya as a journalist, he went to Libya as a, as a fighter who also had a camera with him. There were times when I was in Iraq that I felt like I was on the wrong side of the camera. Not necessarily that I wanted to be a soldier, but I didn't want to be just a documentarian. I mean, you're right. There's an enormous amount of navel gazing here amongst, amongst journalists and insider baseball um, of how he was representing himself. Navel gazing is is overstating my my feeling. I, I think it, it, they're totally legitimate questions to be asking. Sure, but just were outside of the scope exactly. of the movie that yeah. I was making. No, I mean, there's, I mean, the the committee to protect journalists says, you know, writes a piece that's incredibly that says, important. He, I mean, you know, yeah. hugely important organization. Uh, Matt comes back and he says, I appreciate what they've done on my behalf. And they write a piece right after that from their ex executive director saying, well, we don't appreciate you, mm. Matthew Van Tech. It was a pretty stinging rebuke. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I mean, that's journalism. But what about the other criticism? I mean, you see, you look at this guy and you have this kind of conflicted thing, which I think happens in a few of your films. I mean, your film about um, uh, the Earth Liberation Front also. He's a megalomaniac in some ways, isn't he? You look at his stuff online, his LinkedIn page, his last job he, he lists as a fighter in a revolution, his, you know, Twitter page says my last, my film's been nominated for 82 awards. I mean, did you get that sense? Because he comes off that way sometimes. Yeah. When I met him, I thought he was an extraordinary person, an extraordinary character. Fascinating, raised all kinds of questions to me about how we define manhood, how we go about chasing manhood, about, about the way that we use cameras to to not just capture our lives, but to craft our stories that we share with the world. And, and those were all questions that, you know, after he left, my wife and I just talked for hours and hours and hours about it. And that's what made me decide that this is a film I want to make. Mm -hmm. I did not, you know, I didn't, I didn't say, oh, I want to make a, a takedown film of Matt Van Dyke because I don't like him. And I didn't say, I want to make a hagiography of this incredible hero, two-dimensional action hero. Yeah. Um, I thought this is a fascinating person who has a lot of different facets, a lot of different layers, and I love movies that expose me to people who have lots of different layers. And, and it's not, I, I of course have a point of view about Matt, I've spent time with him and I, and I have a sense of who he is myself. What, what, what is the point but of the view? Point of the but the point of the film. What is your point of view? Well, I'm hesitant I, a little bit to I, share I understand, it because, but, but I'll tell you why I'm hesitant. Yeah. I made the film, on purpose the way that I made it, which was that I, I wanted to expose people to this character and let them 
draw their conclusions about him in the same way that, that um, you know, you meet somebody in a bar, you meet somebody on a long airplane ride, and, and, and you walk away from that experience stretched. Whether you agree with their politics, whether you agree with the choices they made in their life, they, they stretch your perspective. And the film intentionally asks questions that it doesn't answer. I mean, the movie ends with me asking him a question, and before he answers it, we cut to black okay. and the yeah. movie's over. Yeah. The structure of that is to invite the audience, to say to the audience, what do you think? Yeah. Go to dinner and, and have a conversation about this. This story of a guy who does something like this is extraordinary. But you're, you, know, you ask a bunch of questions during the film. They're sort of subtle, they're sort of landmines that are placed throughout the film. What are those questions that most people should be or are confronted with in watching this film? Well, I mean, for me, the, one of the main questions is how should we live our lives? I mean, there's this spectrum that at one end of the spectrum is sit in your cubicle and, and do your tasks every day. And at the other end of the spectrum is go on reckless, ill-thought-through adventures. You did just reveal yourself by saying ill-thought-through. No, I said that's, a, that's one extreme. <laughs> one extreme. And I think Matt, saying him. Matt has been all of those things. Yeah. He, he, he lived in his parents' basement. As he would say, you know, certainly during the times that he was, that he was traveling in, in Afghanistan and getting punched out, and I think a lot of those things he says in retrospect, that was, that was ill-considered and reckless. And, and I, I like for the audience, when you're watching you know, him on his motorcycle traveling through Northern Africa, I anyway, I can speak only for myself, but I feel like, oh, that's amazingly romantic and wonderful. Yeah, yeah. And when you hear of somebody who's decided to, to give up everything to go help his friends fight a dictator, and that's in a war that I watched on television from my sofa, that to me, there's a challenge in there. Um, and I think different people read the movie very differently. You know, which is, a, I mean, an interesting thing as a filmmaker, too, because, you know, Stephen Holden, I think, was the, who reviewed it for the New York Times. And it didn't seem like he was reviewing the film. He was reviewing Matt Van Dyke. And is that a problem for that you have to come up against the people who have an allergic reaction to a character who is, seems like really narcissistic and really sort of self-centered, despite the fact that he's making these strange sacrifices for people he barely knows? Is that a problem that you have to confront with, say, hey, judge the film as this arc, yeah. as a sort of exposition of this type of mentality rather than the character? Well, it's funny, a, 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 a critic who I know pretty well um, said to me, you know, 80% of reviews of documentaries are, do I agree with the politics? Do I like the main character? Mm -hmm. And he said, they rarely explore the filmmaking, they rarely explore complexity, and it's, do I agree with the politics? Do I like the main character? And he said, and that's different for fiction film. Yeah. Because you can go see Foxcatcher, or you can go see Blue Velvet, exactly. and you can say, wow, what a fascinating exploration of somebody who, who I don't like. And, and um, I think that people's expectation is, if somebody's the subject of a documentary, uh, they have to be Martin Luther King, you know, yeah. or they have to be somebody who's inspirational and flawless and 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 perfect in every way. And if they're not, then that's a that's the fault of a film. Um, I, I guess I see I see the point of making documentaries to to shine light on the human experience, which is ultimately complex. And so, when I see a film that is complex, I I love that. Um, and I think that, honestly. There are lots of people who see films and can, and can see layers within films. Um, even the Stephen Holden piece, uh, I mean, it was... Which, by the way, I just want to point out, had the longest correction I have seen in a New York Times uh, review in some time now. Right, it was like right. a two-paragraph correction of things that he got wrong. quite surprising. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> quite surprising. Yeah. He saw some difference, I think, between the film and the character. He, there were some positive adjectives that he used to describe the film. Mm -hmm. In as much as 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 you know, he had negative feelings about about Matt himself. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I, so it's an interesting thing talking about the politics of a film. So I mean, we've politicized everything these days. You have your career. You do some films about polarizing characters. Mm -hmm. What is it that attracts you to these types of characters? I mean, is it? I mean, is there a theme in your filmmaking where you uh, you're attracted to one type of person trying to kind of get to a sort of greater instinct that these type of people have. I wouldn't say that there's a theme that I, you know, an external theme that then I look for things that fit into that theme, but I would say that, you know, like everybody, there are certain 
bones that I can't stop gnawing on. And, and, and in this case, uh, I, as I've looked back at my films, I think that I'm particularly interested in people who have really strong passions and the moment when those passions bang into reality. What is it that, that brings you to a film? Um, usually it's serendipity of actually meeting somebody. So, I mean, with, with Street Fight, um, I had been looking around for a first film. I had been doing internet work for a bunch of years, but, but really wanted to make a documentary. And, um, and so uh, I was... And that of, was what year? That was 2002, I guess. 2002. Yeah. What were you doing prior to that? Uh, taught high school students in Washington, D.C. I worked at public radio in Philadelphia for a little while. And um, then I, I started working at a company um, in Soho that was doing interactive documentaries for museums. And it was just before the internet really hit, mm -hmm. so like 95, 96. But I loved documentary, and so... So you're looking for, for, for a subject for your first film. Yeah, um, and, and I met Cory Booker. And he said that he was thinking about where he was probably gonna run for mayor. We ain't going nowhere. And we don't need no carpetbaggers coming here telling us how bad we are. The police is down at 505 on Prospect ripping down our signs. A new day is dawning in Newark. The sun is rising. You know, he's got this fascinating charisma that's very different from Sharp James's amazing charisma. And it seemed like, um, a, a, an amazing time in, in African American politics because around the country you had these races where young guys who had been born after the civil rights movement and had gone to Yale and Stanford and places like that were taking on the, the lions of the civil rights movement. And that seemed like an interesting change. What were their views on race? What were their views on politics? And how did they, how were they different? So that's what made me decide to make Street Fight. So, I mean, these films just come to you. They just yeah, sort of walk racing into your life. Racing Teams was a little different. Yeah. I was interested in NASCAR sort of as a phenomenon because yeah. I knew that it's the second biggest spectator sport in America, and yet no one who I knew could name two NASCAR drivers. Welcome to the Motor Speedway, the first race of National Championship Series. And I thought that that is... A, fascinating that yeah. there could be, you know, everybody knows baseball players, everybody yeah. knows football players, but there's this weird sport that is almost maps with the red state, blue state thing. Yeah. Um, and so I was interested in that kind of as a cultural phenomenon. And then I read an article about these kids that, that race in what's basically the little league for NASCAR. And so, um, so I went to some races and met some kids and uh, met 60 kids and picked these three to be the subjects of the and film. And you say, I want to make a film about you. And they yeah. say, who is this yeah. weird guy right. who has just shown up? This and Yankee. Say, you know, <laughs> this <laughs> Yankee carpetbagger who exactly. wants to make a film about us. Uh, let's get back to the current, the current okay. film, which, uh, you know, you've just garlanded with all these awards already. I must be very pleased by that. W what does Matt think about his own story? He was angry at you mm. for that first scene. For the opening scene. Why? Yeah. So the, the film opens... Because he sees as, himself as a very different person than that's he sees, what it right? Is, yeah. yeah. So the, the film opens with a scene that is actually shot that we return to later in the film while he's on his motorcycle journey. And as you mentioned, he's got sort of long hair and he's in front of a white wall. And Carrie Smith and Weston Extreme Ops Knife. Um, knife that I wear attached to my shin. In addition to body armor and a jacket, of course I have a helmet. Uh, this helmet's been fitted with a helmet camera mount. When I saw that footage, I thought it was riveting. I thought it was fascinating. And to me, it made me say, who is this person? And, and that's how you want to start a film. I, I, I feel like you, you don't want a film to answer questions that people haven't asked, because that's a lecture. It, it, so, you, so when you're constructing your film, you want to, to generate questions and then let the, let the film answer the question. So if you'd started with Matt's backstory, I grew up, blah, 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 here's what I did, then people would, they were watching, just say, who cares? I don't even know who you are, I'm not interested. But when you watch those first two minutes of the film, and then this guy comes in and says, I was a child. Then it's the answer to a question that the audience is asking. That's what I loved about it. What Matt doesn't like about it is that he feels like he's very far from the character that he was playing on camera during those years. And, um, and so to open the film with that, he feels um, sort of cheapens the, the learning process that, that he's gone through. But and, wait, and, and I mean, grown. is this, I mean, this must be a difficult thing for you. I mean, obviously, you know, you get full control of the footage, but you also, I mean, that indicates to me in some ways 
that Matt wants you to do a hagiography. Because that first scene shows a kid who is naive, you know, in this, what's his name, Max Hunter. He you know, has his you know, shirtless with his knife out and being a tough guy. And if he doesn't want to include that, I mean, he wants you to tell a glorious and heroic story, whereas you have a sort of a warts and all portrait. It is very hard to expose yourself to the world. And, and I think Matt sees his story as a, a coming-of-age story that has, you know, a, a chapter one that, he's, that he feels very far from, and, um, and, and then there's a revelation about, about the importance of helping your friends and, and, and being involved in, in uh, defeating tyrants. This was the most filmed war in history. With cameras everywhere. There were guys with cell phone cameras in the middle of gunfights. Cell phone and camera in one hand, AK-47 in the other. And I think when you read reviews, there have been some incredibly harsh descriptions of him that doubt that there was anything noble about what he did or that there was any sense of self-sacrifice, that, that see it entirely as narcissism and, and, and um, uh, adventure-seeking. And, you know, he doesn't see it that way at all. He thinks that, that was, there was a chapter of that and, that that and that there was another chapter where that was not the case anymore. Do you think it, and it's frustrating you, to him and, and, yeah. and hurtful, I think. I mean, I understand, but do, I mean, do you think that it undermines the idea of a personal journey when somebody is as, and I'll just be totally frank about it, is as self-promoting as Matt is? I mean, the personal journey is the, the prefix there. That's personal. It's like, I went through this, you know, I'll, I didn't, I, I interviewed Matt mm. for Vice Magazine. I never actually used the interview. And I went back to find it. I went back to listen to it. And it was a pretty interesting thing to go back and listen to. Uh, but in my, in my uh, email exchanges with him, he was the one that was contacting me and saying, well, what are you, you going to do? What are you going to do about this? And, you know, you look at his social media presence. He's a very, very active you know, participant in creating his own myth. Is that a personal journey or is that somebody who's, you know, trying to, you know, still, whether it's Max Hunter or Matt Van Dyke, trying to construct a character? Particularly in the age of, of Twitter and Facebook, I think, and this is one of the things that I think is interesting about the film, Matt is an extreme version of it because he's doing this stuff in a war zone, and, but, but we all are thinking about how we're perceived, and we're all crafting these characters of, of ourselves. There's a great uh, Salman Rushdie line that I heard him say at a, in an interview one time where he said, you know, people tell stories about themselves to give them control over their lives, and it's the, te the telling of your narrative crafts who you are and, and, and gives you control over, over who you are, both how people see you and how you see yourself, how you actually are, and now, I think with cell phone cameras and Twitter and Facebook, we do that digitally, you know? And, and so, yeah, Matt is, Matt is, is working to, to, to get his story out into the world and to, and to you know, push his point of view and, and to, you know, a, a greater or lesser extent, a lot of us are. The one thing I did want to ask you about, and it was something that when I was listening to my interview with Matt, um, you know, this is Matt's film in some ways, your film and his film, and I was listening to it, and I was listening to this rosy diagnosis of what was going to happen in Libya. And Matt said to me, you know, there's no way that these Islamists could take over. There's no way that it will descend into this terrible civil war. But in the film, did you feel that you wanted to address the fact that somebody who goes to Libya for these big ideals and, you know, overthrows Qaddafis and with these people that do, um, and the whole thing is a total disaster. I mean, is that something that you ever talk to Matt about or address? Yeah. Because his great sort of, we should, don't just sit there, let's overthrow dictators, seems like a pretty bad idea to me, actually, <laughs> in the end of the day, because look, look what happened. Yeah, I, again, this was one of those where I thought, okay, how much of the politics and the, of the region do I need to get into? Um, and there is a place for a film about the Libyan Revolution. Uh, you know, there are many films about the Arab Spring and, and the results of the Arab Spring. And, um, and I ultimately said, 
that's not really what this film is about. Does and, it, but does it complicate his kind of path in any way where he says that, you know, I'm doing this to, to become a man and in some ways you're doing it to be, become a man by fighting in a revolution that ends up like this? He would say that, that it, these are, you know, the, the growing pains of a, of, a, of a liberated country and that a lot of countries have revolutions that um, you know follow their independence and that civil wars that follow their revolutions and that uh, they're sort of working their way through it I, I'm not gonna yeah. I'm not gonna judge that myself I mean you keep the noise out of it which I, I as a as a viewer appreciated yeah. that you know so many other people would have the instinct to say you know all these critics of Matt van Dyke let's you know, let's sprinkle them throughout the movie to give another perspective. You just, you leave it out there. I feel like people can draw their own conclusions. They, yeah. they didn't need somebody to say, well, I disagree with what Matt's doing because blah, 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 blah. I think that people who like Matt Van Dyke when they meet him, like him after watching the movie. And people who don't like Matt don't like him in the movie. And, and he's a pretty me, polarizing figure. And, and, yeah. It is, yeah. I mean, but it's not yeah. polarizing because it's a, you know, tricky. It's polarizing because I think it accurately shows who this guy is. No, and yeah, that there yeah. are some people who like him and some people who don't. I think there's a, there, I have that feeling in the film. There's, there's, a, there's a shot um, where Matt is on the back of a pickup truck in Libya firing a, what appears to be a 50 caliber gun. And my, my immediate, that, that flashes on the screen. And I said, what the fuck is this kid doing? And that, I mean, that's the great feeling you're supposed to have, I guess, from this. I mean, that's what you're trying to draw out of people, right? I mean, to get them to question, you know, would you do something like this? And what is the kind of morality of doing something like this, right? Yeah, and there are some people who watch that exact same clip and they say, wow, he's, he's in it, he's doing this important, he's in the middle of this important battle and he's, he's putting himself out there. And the question is, at the end of the film, is what? I don't think this gives away too yeah, much. No, I mean, in the very beginning of the film, he says, I wanted to go on a crash course in manhood. And, and so I ask him at the end, all right, it's five years later. Five years ago, you set out on this crash course in manhood. Were you successful? And, and then we end the movie. And that's a, you know, an open question, one of many open questions that, that I think the, the film asks along the way. You're not going to answer, but I have to ask. What, did, what he did, said? Is it, no, but I, what he says, I kind of have a sense that he that he believes he became a man. What do you think? 